What's up, everyone? Today we're going to take a look at Todd Gurley and that Rams offense and how incredibly deadly they've been on the ground since Gurley's return from that ACL tear at Georgia last year. Now, that's not to say that the Rams run game was bad with Trey Mason as the lead back or anything, but Gurley has shown himself to be the key that makes everything work much more efficiently as soon as he started racking up carries in week four. Now, when I say the key, what do I mean? Every little nuance in the St. Louis ground game has been built off of one dangerous element for the last couple of weeks, and that's Todd Gurley's speed. He's a track star in a power lifter's body, to be honest, and that scares the hell out of a defensive coordinator because you know that he's probably stronger than all your DBs, and he's probably faster than all your linebackers at the same time. Now that speed is important because the Rams are primarily a zone running team, meaning they like to stretch defenses from sideline to sideline to create a lot of their biggest gains on the ground from the seams that those lateral stretches create when defenses lose discipline. If you have a running back like Todd Gurley who's a legit low 4-4 sprinter, your top priority as a defense is to prevent him from getting a crease on that front side so that he can't get the edge. Because if he gets the edge, you're done. That fear of his speed causes linebackers to start over pursuing, which then opens up every other run play in the playbook to a potentially big game. Now, I said that they are primarily a zone running team, but St. Louis really has five different moving parts of their run game that mix and match together when designing all of their plays. It makes almost every single run play, regardless of formation, look exactly the same, so the defense never really knows what they're going to get. You've got inside zone, outside zone, lineback lead, the end around with a wide receiver, which is usually Tavon Austin, and last but not least, releasing their lead blockers as receivers to the flat to get easy gains off play action passes, which helps loosen up the box a little when defenders start flowing a bit too hard against the run. And oftentimes they'll still release those lead blockers as receivers even if it is a run play, because they're hoping to draw a backside defender away from the ball in coverage, and that's why I listed it as part of their run game, because even though it's a passing concept, they often use it to widen defenses against the run as well as a fake. Now, I'll explain what all five of those things mean, of course, but just know that almost all of their run plays combine two or more of these elements at any given time, and they pretty much all look the same right up until the last possible second. So, first, a zone run. What is a zone run? In short, like before, it's a lateral run play. Gap runs, power runs, all those downhill running terms you're used to hearing, they go north-south. They go straight ahead. Zone runs, however, go east-west, side to side, until a crease presents itself, which is when the running back makes his cut and gets upfield. Gap runs and power runs are read inside out by a running back, meaning he's reading it from the inside to the outside of the offensive line. Zone runs, however, are typically read by a running back outside in. You read the outside shoulder of the furthest outside blocker. If a defender is there containing the edge, you read the outside shoulder of your next closest blocker. If that next closest blocker won on his reach block and the lane is open, you cut into it. If he didn't win and the defender closed it down, you read the next closest blocker and so on and so on and so on. Your eyes are just progressing from the outside in until you see a blocker who won and then you follow him. Or failing that, just take the natural cutback lane that's there when the defense over pursues. This run right here from the Cardinals game in week four is a good example of the front side getting closed down by the defense. So Gurley peeks backside, sees the cutback lane, and takes it. All he has to do is clear the pursuit angles of these backside defenders to get himself into the second level cleanly. And he's so explosive that, of course, he does shake off that pursuit and gashes him for 12 yards. If you've got a physically gifted running back like Todd Gurley who can get upfield in a hurry in just one cut, he can rip off these hard runs all day long when defenders get stretched out and keep that offense on schedule. Now, the second element of the St. Louis run game builds off of this, and I'll go one snap before that zone run I just showed you. It's called a windback lead. A lead is a run play, like it sounds like, that has a lead blocker involved, usually a fullback or an H-back in the backfield. In the Rams case, they usually run a lead with their H-back tight end, Lance Kendricks, and he's gotten to be pretty good as a lead blocker. 
A wind back is also what it sounds like. A running back takes the handoff from one side of the quarterback and then winds back to the other side of the formation while following his lead blocker and trying to get that edge. Technically, this is a gap scheme run and not a zone scheme run, but initially off the snap, it looks like a zone run to the defense because everyone's moving laterally. However, instead of reach blocks and cut blocks from the offensive line, they're all executing down blocks simply to move everyone the hell out of the way in one direction while the lead blocker goes the other direction. The Rams love using this concept for two reasons. One, if a defense starts flowing too hard against their zone run to keep Gurley from getting that edge front side, they use these windbacks to then hit them on the backside and hopefully spring another big gain. Two, as they do get a big gain or two with these windback runs, defenders sometimes stop flowing so hard against the zone run's front side, which opens up creases on that front side. Both of these run concepts look exactly the same off the snap and defenses basically have to guess which one they're going to get. Now that they have a running back like Gurley who's fast enough to make them suffer if they guess wrong, the Rams can basically do anything they want on the ground and eventually they'll break something. Next element of the run game, the end around. Zone runs and windback leads are how the Rams scheme themselves to get Gurley into space, but the real X factor for this offense is Tavon Austin. We unfortunately had to watch Brian Schottenheimer completely waste Austin as a talent in this offense for the first two years of his career. But now new offensive coordinator Frank Signetti seems to have made it his personal mission in life to give this guy the ball in any way possible. Austin only had 44 targets and 242 yards last year with no receiving touchdowns. In the last three weeks alone since Gurley's comeback, Austin has had 17 targets, 140 yards, and three touchdowns. Now that St. Louis has a running back to be their engine on offense, they are finally opening it up and letting Tavon be used like Tavon needs to be used. Screens, end arounds, deep balls, rub routes, just give them the ball in space and watch them go, and that's exactly what they're doing. In this offense, now that Gurley's here, these two work off each other so well from a schematic standpoint. The Rams love to show his zone run with Gurley in one direction, then hit him with an end around in the other direction. Either the defense's backside pursuit stays home and bites in the end around, or they collapse down on the cutback lane for Gurley. Again, choose wrong, and they get ripped for a big game. And both plays look exactly the same, so you've got no idea what they're actually running. They'll even run a windback look with an end around going in the same direction, because they'll just use that lead blocker to now block for Austin instead of Gurley. Like I said, they mix and match all these different elements together to create their playbook, and you can never tell what they're doing until it's too late. Example here, fourth quarter against the Cardinals, the Rams are trying to close out the game, so of course they're going to lean on their ground game. They fake the handoff with Gurley and give the end around to Austin, and he's so fast that he burns the pursuit angles and converts a first down on second and ten. However, back it up and you can see why he burned those angles. Dayon Buchanan, great hybrid safety linebacker for Arizona, really good young player, identifies the end around and he starts to bite on it. But then he stops and peeks back at Gurley because he wasn't sure who had the ball. He only hesitated for a fraction of a second, but with someone as fast as Austin, that's all it takes. This is what the scheme was designed for. Make everything look the same to the point where you can't identify what the hell's going on until it's already too late. And it was already too late for Buchanan. They've got so much speed coming out of the backfield now that if you hesitate, you lose every single time. The very next snap, Rams fake the end around and the windback lead. Buchanan and linebacker Kevin Minter both flow backside towards that lead, which leaves a frontside crease open for Gurley, and he's so fast that as soon as he clears himself into space in that second level, it's over, 52 yards. And he only gets stopped because of an incredible effort from Tyron Matthew to chase him down. This is what St. Louis has been waiting to do since the day they drafted Todd Gurley. These last two weeks when Gurley's taken over as the lead back against Arizona and Green Bay, St. Louis has averaged 176 yards rushing a game. The NFL leader right now is the Seahawks at 142 yards a game. This right here is the real Rams offense. Beating people to a pulp with a run game that has so many different moving parts and so much speed that it's almost impossible to know what's coming next. And now that the run game is so good, the play action passing game is being opened up as linebackers suck up against the run, safeties are dropping down in the box, which gives receivers one-on-one -on -one looks deep downfield which of course helps Austin more than anything because he's faster than basically everybody else on the field. And even the screen game is getting opened up a bit off play action as defenders flow one way and then have to try to pursue the ball carrier in space backside when they already are a few steps behind. Really, the only thing that I've seen stop this new Rams offense is this new Rams offense. 
the number of drives that Jared Cook has killed all by himself with drop balls is staggering. He cannot catch the ball. Whether he's semi-covered on a jump ball or wide open on third and seven, his drops have crippled this team in the last three weeks. Even one of Foles' four interceptions against the Packers was Cook's fault because he literally stopped running in the middle of his route and Foles was leading him with the throw. It just sailed right past Cook into the arms of Quentin Rollins for a pick six. That's a touchdown in a very close game on the board for Green Bay because of Jared Cook. It's not all on him though, even worse than that pick. Rams were in the red zone late trying to make a comeback. Foles locked in on his first read on the shallow cross and tried to force it in when he's got another man coming across the backside of the end zone that he easily could have hit for a wide open TD. He just didn't see him or didn't want to see him. I don't know what it was. It was just a bad decision, a bad throw, and a terribly timed interception. Perhaps the worst one of all, though, fourth quarter against the Steelers, and they're still in the game because of their defense at this point. They're playing lights out. They capitalize on another end around to get 24 yards, set up all the way down at the Pittsburgh seven-yard line. Right after that, though, false start, incomplete fade, false start again, and all of a sudden you go from first and goal at the seven to third and goal at the 17 in a one-score game in the fourth quarter. Obviously, they didn't get the touchdown. They didn't win the game. And sometimes this team simply can't get out of their own way. If they played with just even a few less mistakes than they do right now, with that run game and that defense like they're all playing right now, they'd be blowing people out. They just have to clean up those mistakes and for the love of God, stop throwing it to Jared Cook on third down. Now that we've seen what their true offense is capable of though with Todd Gurley in tow, as long as they're healthy, I think the Rams can make the playoffs. They're extraordinarily dangerous. Gurley and the promotion of Frank Signetti to offensive coordinator, I think might have been the missing pieces here for this franchise. Foles isn't even a bad quarterback. He's not terrible, he's not elite, but he's not bad. He's at the very least average, despite a couple of his bad picks. And how long have people been saying that once the Rams got an average quarterback, they'd be a good team? A long frickin' time. Well, they got one. Now the rest of the NFC is going to have to deal with the consequences of that. Good luck, I guess. Anyway, that's all I got for today. Like and subscribe for more Film Room content. I'll have another video out in a week or two. Not sure what the subject's going to be yet, but hopefully you like that one too. Until then, later. Later.